Okay, so here's your review. Chapter 3, Electronic Structure and the Periodic Table. Remember our light lab with heat energy in. We put like heat, like the flame, or we did the electricity to the cathode ray tubes, and we got light energy out as it fell back down. We're going to review all that. Okay, so here's the periodic table that we colored, only I've stretched it out. Remember that we had um, the two that were yellow. This was the S shell. And the S shell was made up of a sphere. Remember that little sphere that we drew? My best guess here. And it is made up of one orbit. And it can hold two electrons. Okay? That was our S. That lower part that was down at the bottom of the periodic table, which is the F, we didn't worry about the shape of it. We know that there's 14 electrons across and it has seven orbits that can hold the 14 electrons. Remember, each orbit can only hold two electrons, one up and one down. Then we had the D shell that is the middle section and it could hold, it has five electrons, or five orbits and it can hold a maximum of 10 electrons and for the most part it was a clover leaf shape on the different axes except for the last orbit which was sort of like a cloud with a thing that looks sort of like that and then we had our last area, the, the red area which is the P and the P had three orbits and a total of six electrons that it could have Okay. We then learned how to do electron configuration. Okay, with electron configuration, before we did electron configuration, we actually did something called orbital notation. And you, if you have your periodic table near you, then you can do this with me. Um, I didn't have my periodic table at home, so I'm going to be doing this from memory. So say that we had oxygen, and we wanted to do the orbital notation for oxygen. We always start up with hydrogen, and hydrogen starts in the 1s, and there's one orbit, and we go up for hydrogen and down for helium. These represent the electrons. We're still not to oxygen. So then we go to the second row with lithium, and lithium is going to be up and beryllium down. Then we would go over on the second row to the p, which has three rooms, or three orbits, and we would go one up for boron, carbon, nitrogen, and then oxygen would be down. That is the distinguishing electron, is the 2p4. So the 2p4 for oxygen is the distinguishing electron. Oxygen also has two unpaired or electrons. I should put P ed. Unpaired electrons. And they ask you that oftentimes. Now, how would we write the electron configuration for this? We would go 1s. 2, 2s, 2, 2p, 4. Okay? <clears throat> so now let's take another one that's a little bit farther down. I'll get myself my periodic table here that I can look at. And let's do one where we can do the orbital notation, the electron configuration, and the shortened or abbreviated or noble gas configuration. Okay, so here we go with bromine. Let's take bromine, and bromine is number 35. So we're going to have 35 arrows when we're done with the orbital notation. So if we did the orbital notation for bromine, we would start at the 1s, then go to the 2s, then to the 2p, then to the 3s. We're still not to bromine. We hit the 3p. Still not to bromine. And we go to the 4D. Okay, then we go to the 4S. Up and down. And then we hit the 3D. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 orbits in the 3D. And we fill the 3D. We go all the way through the 3D. We're still not to bromine. We just made it to zinc. Then at gallium, we hit the 4P. And the 4P we fill with 
5. Now we've got bromine. So this is the orbital notation for bromine. Now to do the electron configuration, it would just be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, and 4p5. We can also do the shortened or the abbreviated version by looking at bromine, which is number 35, and finding the noble gas that is closest to without going over, so play the prices right, and that is argon. So we put argon in brackets, and then we start from argon and go forward. So we'd have 4s2, 3d10, and 4p5. 5. Now remember with the abbreviated or the noble gas configuration, you've got to rearrange it. So you got to put argon, and then you've got to go shell out. So the, the closest shell in, which is the 3D10, goes first, and then the 4S2, and then the 4P5. That's the abbreviated version right there. Now we can also do, remember, the Lewis dot. Lewis dot for bromine just includes the S and the P. So when we do bromine, we would go BR, and then we would take and put the dots around it. We had two in the S, and we have one, two, three, four, five in the P. So this would be the Lewis dot for bromine. Okay, remember that um, when we're talking about columns, we're talking about groups or families and those are the numbers that are across the top and they represent the column so they go down the column okay now uh, as we look at the ones on the left those represent the shell or the period and they'll talk about both of those and I like to think about this as like battleship um, as you're playing it a lot of times they'll say on shell 3 and and you come across on shell 3, and group 13, and you look for that element right there. Or they give you an element and say it's in this family, what group is it in, or, or what shell is it in. So it's just a matter of like playing Battleship. Real easy. Don't make it too hard. Remember also that when they talk about shell, they also talk about the subshell, and we talked about those earlier. The subshells are the S, the P, the D, and the F. So make sure you don't get confused shell and subshell. Shell is the number of that row, and remember that row does change as you get to the D. It becomes the 3, the 4, the 5, and the 6, and when you go down to the F, it's the 4 and the 5. So remember that. Okay. Also, when they talk about shell designation, they're talking about putting the subshell and the shell together. So, for instance, a, a shell designation would be like 5S or 4D or um, 5F. So, I'm putting both the shell and the subshell together. Okay, with the valence shell, we're worried about just the S and the P. The S, remember, can hold 2 and the P can hold six. So together they hold a total of eight valence electrons. If you think of valence electrons, that's what we had in our Lewis dot. Remember when we did our Lewis dot that we could have a total of eight around. That represents our valence shell electrons. So if you remember the valence shell electrons with the Lewis dot, then you can really quickly say, oh, that row has however many. Going over really quickly, valence electrons and Lewis dot. The first two columns, remember these were the S and they were in yellow. So we're going to just quickly color a little bit of yellow in here to help you remember. These are what the, um, the Lewis dots looked like for the first column. It's just one dot. For the second column, remember they go opposite. And then we skip clear over to the P. Remember the P over here? I'm going to put these inside, so I'm going to spread this out a little bit. Oh, I need one more. Okay, so this is the P area over here, the last six columns. So as I'm looking at this, these were the ones that were the red area. Okay, so if you remember, this is the red, 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 red. 
Okay, so this one right here would be in a triangle, so it had three valence electrons. This one, four, so most of the time it went on four, one on each side. This one would do a two on the top, one, one, and one. I'm going to come down in here. This one would have two on the top, two on this side, and one on each of the other sides. Now I'll go back up here. This one would have two on the top, two, two, and one. And the very last one, which is noble gases, they had their outer octet or their valence shell full. So you've got to remember that. If you can remember the Lewis dots, you've got the valence shells down. Anything in that column has. So one for the first column, two for the second column. So you go across to the P, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight valence shells. Electrons. Okay, we've got two rules that we need to remember. Um, Hund's rule. Hund's rule is you got to think back to the orbital notation when we were putting um, the electrons in the orbit, say the p orbit. We put one in each orbit before we went back and paired it. This is known as Hund's rule. It basically says that you have to put one in each orbit of the same energy level before you can go back and pair it. So it's like the bus rule. Everybody wants their own seat on the bus until the bus is full and then we got to start pairing up. Okay, and then we got the Pauli exclusion principle which says that within an orbit the electrons have to have opposite spin. So one has to go in as an up arrow, one has to go in as a down arrow. So they have to have opposite spin or spin in opposite um, directions. Then we have the off bar, which basically says that we've got to fill the lowest energy first. So, in other words, I've got to fill 1s before I fill the 2s. And I've got to fill the 2s before I fill the 2p. So as long as you remember, off, in, with off bar, just fill starting with hydrogen going forward. And don't skip a number. Okay, we have the yellow area, which is the s and the red area, which represents the P. Both of these are what are known as representative elements. These are the ones that make up our Lewis dot, our valence electrons. Um, they're the ones that are going to react when we combine with other elements. The ones in the blue are known as the transition elements and the ones in the green are known as the inner transition elements. So if you're asked if an L, what kind of an element it is then you need to at, find out where it's at. Now the one thing with the represent, representative elements that you need to be aware of is that you have this noble gas area over here, that last column, and they have their own name and it is noble gas. So you got to remember that this is noble gas for that last column. Okay, for that last column it's noble gas, but everything else and the yellow and the red are the representative. Okay, so now we need to divide the periodic table up a little bit different. The blue here are metals, and the red is non-metals, and the yellow-orange here are what we call metalloids. They have the properties of both metals and non-metals, and that would be boron, silicon, um, geranium, arsenic, um, antimony, tellurium, astatine, and they think an unoctium, or an unseptium, sorry, 117. Okay, so these are considered to be the metalloids. Okay, now let's talk about metals and metalloids. So metals have very high conductivity so metals um, 
again have high conductivity with heat and with electricity. They also are ductile, meaning they can be pulled into wire. They're also malleable, meaning that I can mold them, hammer them into different shapes. They also have what is called a metallic luster. They reflect light. Okay, so if we look at nonmetals, then, we have something that's brittle, that it doesn't pull into wire or isn't malleable. We have something that is a powdery solid or gas. We have something that will insulate, not conduct electricity at all, or heat. Then we have what's known as metalloids. Metalloids are semiconductors. They have properties of both metals and nonmetals. They somewhat conduct heat and somewhat conduct electricity, but not real great. They're not very ductile. They're semi-ductile. They're not malleable or, or they're not very lustrous. So they're in between metals and nonmetals. Now another thing we need to worry about are periodic trends. Let's look at that. Okay, most periodic trends trend from francium to fluorine, and that's in almost everything. Okay, so as we're looking at the trends, we're going to look at how they trend from francium to fluorine. So, first trend is um, atomic radius. Okay, so if we look at atomic radius, we have francium that's going to be very, very big in comparison to fluorine. Now even as we go across a row, on the same row, we're going to get large to small going towards fluorine. So the large on this side for atomic radius, the larger you get going down and this way. The smaller I get going across towards fluorine and up. Okay. As I go down a column, the more likely that I am going to have a solid at the bottom. So I might have a gas like fluorine at the top, and by the time I get to the bottom, I've got a solid. Now that trend is for most of them. They're always the exception to the rule. Okay, we're going to talk about ionization energy now. This is the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron. Say that we started with calcium and we removed one electron. That would make it like the um, element next to it, which is potassium. That would be relatively low energy because it actually wants to be like the noble gas below um, calcium, which over here is argon. So it still wants it wants to give up two electrons. So giving up one is low. Giving up another one is low also. And now, after giving up the second, I would become like this noble gas argon. If I try to then remove one more electron, so the first is low, the second is low, but if I tried to remove the third, I would get a very high amount of energy that I would have to remove it because now I've become a noble gas. So ionization energy is how much energy it takes to take off an electron. Just like if I were to have something like um, bromine, which is right here. Bromine is one away from being a noble gas. It wants to gain one electron. So if I try and ionize it to become like the, the element next to it, which is selenium, then its first ionization energy is going to be extremely high because it's going farther away from a noble gas. And it's just going to keep getting higher and higher and higher as I head this way, taking more electrons off. So I can tell really quickly where the noble gas is by what the ionization energies look like. So again, the trend for between francium and fluorine is as I go towards fluorine, I increase an ionization energy because ionization energy, again, is taking away an electron. So the closer I get to fluorine, the more it wants electrons and doesn't want to give them away. Okay, good luck. You may have a 3i5 card for the test written only on one side. Don't forget 
to have your lab and your note notebooks ready to turn in at the first of class. That means your note notebooks are um, scored and ready to just be recorded and your lab notebooks are tabbed with the labs in the table of contents and you finished each of them with a conclusion and error analysis. See you in class.